The experiments. To prove what he has said, he then asks the reader to gather various magnets and welding rods and wire so you can make homemade magnets and compasses as quoted from his text. Take two pieces of steel fishing line wire, put them in a U-shaped magnet, hold a little while, take them out, bend a little back in one end and hang them up and make it so that one magnet's lower end is north pole magnet and the other south pole magnet. Make it so that they hang three inches apart, but north pole north side and south pole south side. Now take the four inch long permanent magnet bar, hold north pole in north side and south pole in south side. Raise slowly up to the two hanging magnets. Then you will see that the hanging magnets are closing up. Now reverse but north pole of bar magnet south side and south pole north side. This time, when bar magnet approaches, the hanging magnets will spread out. This experiment shows that north and south pole magnets are equal in strength and that the streams of individual magnets are running one kind of magnet against the other kind. It has you make vertical magnets. And as you place them according to their magnetic orientation with the earth poles, then raise the magnet with the opposite pole orientation to show the magnetic streams attract each other. Then switch magnetic orientation of the magnet to show that the same poles repel each other. It also shows they repel and attract equally. Cut a strip of tin can about two inches wide and a foot long. Put the north pole of the U-shaped magnet on top and dip the lower end in iron filings and see how much it lifts. Change several times. Then you will see that the north pole lifts more than the south pole. Now put the north pole magnet under the iron filing box and see how much it pushes up. Now change. Put the south pole magnet under the box and see how much it pushes up. Do this several times. Then you will see that the south pole magnet pushes up more than the north pole magnet. This experiment shows, again, that on level ground, the magnets are in equal strength. The North Pole lifts slightly more BBs and retains more after shaking the pole to see if the agitation makes the BBs fall off. I used smaller magnets than Ed did with shorter distances of magnetically induced poles. I tried the iron filings for the pushing up effect, but this method was too difficult to determine any difference. So I tried the magnetic repulsion test and found the south pole of the magnet pushed the south pole of the test magnet further away. Now take the three foot long soft steel welding rod. It is already magnetized as a permanent magnet. Hang it in a fine thread so it is level. Now measure each and you will see that the south end is longer. In my location at Rockgate between the 25th and 26th latitude and 81st longitude west. In three foot long magnet the south pole end is about 16th of an inch longer. Further north it should be longer yet. But at equator both ends of the magnet should be equal in length. In Earth's so south hemisphere the north pole end of the magnet should be longer. This is part of the reason Ed believed the magnetism was derived from the Earth. The south pole of the welding rod is in fact longer. I am 250 miles north of Ed's location and the south pole of the magnet is 1 32nd of an inch longer in 2013 than the north pole of the hanging magnetic rod. Ed's results in 1945 was 1 32nd of an inch shorter than my measurements. So it appears that not only was Ed right, but it seems to have increased in length because of the pole shift over the last 68 years or so. I've, I have tried this procedure with various lengths of hard metal with the same results occurring. The magnetic balancing point is different than the material center point. The neutral zone is also not at the center of the rod's length. Ed knew that when material was magnetized, its center of balance changed. All my hanging magnets or compasses never point to the Earth's magnetic pole. 
neither to the geographical pole. They point a little northeast. The only reason I can figure out why they point in this way is, looking from the same geographical meridian the North man Magnetic Pole is on, the South Magnetic Pole is 115 longitudes west from it. In rough estimation, the Earth's South Magnetic Pole is 260 miles west from the same meridian, and the Earth's North Pole Magnet is on. That causes the North and South Pole Magnets to run in northeast and southwest direction. My location is too far away from the magnetic poles, so all my magnets are guided by the general stream of individual and north and south pole magnets. To summarize, one, Ed once again shows with vertical magnets that the streams of magnets come out of the poles in straight streams. Two, Ed shows these streams are occurring simultaneously on each pole. Three, Ed shows the forces are equal on level ground. Four, Ed shows that when material is magnetized, the balance point is not in the center of the material. Five, Ed shows the magnetic behavior of magnets are coming from the earth, not the material it is composed of. Conclusions will be reached on Ed's static magnetism in episode four. This is the conclusion of Ed's material on static magnetism, but we'll be covering more observations on static magnetism starting with the shape of natural magnetic fields, which are vortexes, not bar-shaped, and in comparison with available geometry of magnets, you cannot easily achieve these natural shapes. As you can observe, the non-magnetic metal BB and sphere will not stay in the middle of the pole of the magnet and seeks the perimeter of the magnet. The rectangular magnet, as well as cylindrical magnets, are easy to manufacture but have a less than ideal geometry and does not exhibit all three induced behaviors of the natural shape of magnetic fields on induced fields in steel cores or armatures, which are vortexes. As you can see, welding rods can be made into permanent magnets and are less than ideal for use as a core material in motors and therefore cannot be economic as an armature or stator material for motors or generators. But these geometries of magnets and their materials are widely available so it's often used with less than the best results. Ed considers the material used for the most advantageous focal points for magnetic particles to be certain metals like hard steel or other materials to make permanent magnets. He considers the material as a lens for magnetic particles which come from the environment. As an example of why Ed thinks the magnetism comes from the environment, when a magnet is broken in two pieces, instead of becoming demagnetized by impact, it becomes two separate magnets with both poles. 
and if it has a strong memory or high permeability, you should easily be able to achieve a monopole structure, but you cannot. And if the magnetism came from the material's atomic structure, the impact would disorganize the polarity of the dipole structure, but it does not. It will always be two separate magnets with both poles. Now, if the material was just a lens for externally induced magnetism, then this behavior is readily understandable. Now look at this magnet, it is broken in half. Instead of becoming demagnetized through impact, it has become two magnets, and because it was axially magnetized, it repels itself being put back together. Again, if the magnetism was induced in the material from an outside source, the material only acting as a lens for the magnetic particles, this behavior would be easily understood, and this is why. As well as the balance point of the material changing in metals when magnetized, that Ed felt the material was a lens for externally induced behavior in the materials. There is so much more to static magnetism which we have not revealed. Near field and far field effects, as well as many other observations on the geometry of the perfect magnet shape. We could go on and on. We will try to cover them later in the series.